Ladies and gentlemen of the crypto space, we're live on a Monday, October 25th at 11.38 a.m. We're going to be talking about some stuff that we know all too well. Uh, we've experienced fear all throughout our uh, our time in these in, in just investing, not even these particular markets. Uh, anyone new to even stocks certainly has fear. Anything new induces fear and even more so in the crypto space, volatility introduces fear, or the history of the crypto space introduces fear. Uh, a lot of folks uh, at this point come from uh, 2017 and 2018, and know we had the asymmetric appreciation, and then basically an asymmetric depreciation, and 2019 was extremely brutal for a lot of people. So we have precedence, and that fear lingers, and people think, History repeats, history rhymes, but we have evidence and, and data and market activity and technologies that suggest it, it certainly won't repeat uh, to to any specific uh, in any specific way as compared to what occurred uh, historically. Uh, there is no reason for capital to exit the crypto space anymore. That is a certainty. It is obvious. Uh, so how does what plays out in a future deflationary impulse compared to previous deflationary impulses. There will be a significant deflationary impulse, but there's a great deal to suggest it won't be anything like what was experienced. Maybe we could experience a 50 plus percent deflationary impulse, 60, 70, 80, which is comparable to what occurred in 2019. It could most likely be a different time frame involved. Maybe it's not a year. Maybe it's not two years. There's clearly different psychology at play. There's clearly a different macroeconomic environment, bit of an unprecedented macroeconom uh, macroeconomic environment considering the debt to GDP ratio. There's a whole lot of factors that goes into how a market is currently behaving and how it, we speculate it's going to behave. History is not going to repeat a identically and it's going to rhyme and it leads to increasing conviction how we think think how we think things are going to play out i have my speculations how th i think things are going to play out but just as the title of this stream says i expect significant drawdowns but I also expect capital to not leave the crypto space in any significant way. 10, 15, 20, 30 percent, maybe. But the logic there is where the hell is it going? Capital flows from underperforming to outperforming assets. What's going to outperform? In theory, I guess the dollar could outperform, but history says the dollar outperform out dollar outperformance is transitory at best, and maybe it's one two years, but now capital could sit depreciating in the crypto space um, for one to two years, earning 30, 40, 50, 60%, because even in a bear market, capital is churning. Monetary velocity breeds opportunity, so you're going to have transaction fees, you're going to have yield. Maybe you're not going to have 70, 80% yield, but if you have 30, 40, 50% yield, okay, you're <laughs> that, that's where the the capital belongs. So there's very different market dynamics that are playing out right now in the crypto space. You just need to start to process, to digest, not necessarily all the nuances, even I don't fully understand all the nuances, but what I do is I tell these stories and they help me understand them and hopefully it'll help you guys understand what is likely, more likely than less likely to play out as compared to periods of time in the past. Certainly not going to be anything like uh, the asymmetric appreciation and depreciation that we saw in like 13, 14, 15. That, that times have passed. If anything, there'll be overtones uh, uh, to what occurred in uh, you know, 17, 18, and then the, uh, the deflationary impulse in, in 19. Um, but there's so many things that make it so different. Uh, there's a great example uh, of what I think is likely to play out expressed in Ampleforth uh, now that there is a debt market, a money market for it. It changes the entire narrative for it. And I think it's a great asset uh, for a variety of reasons. It has overtones that allow it to be compared to Ohm and Time. 
But each one of those three assets has a very different story to be told, completely different projects. And just because you see 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 80,000 percent returns, annualized returns, doesn't mean they're the same in any way, shape or form. Um, And I don't fully have a capacity to tell the whole story yet. But the reason I'm mentioning this is, one, uh, looking at the Amplifor chart, which we're going to pull up right now, it gives us a good sense uh, of what volatility means and what high rates of return mean for looking at things at a long time horizon, which does play into omen time. Uh, uh, Omen time in brevity, you know, the risk-free rate, the risk-free price of the asset. Uh, During a deflationary impulse, there's no reason to not expect the price to trend towards the risk-free rate of the asset. Uh, And that's exactly what uh, Olympus Dow talked about in their original documentation, that, yeah, even though um, the rates of return are large and you could expect significant drawdowns, the interest rate will compensate over X amount of time. Over enough time, the portfolio will grow. And the same with time, but time has different components entirely, particularly omen time has such a different story. It's extraordinary. But let's start with Ampleforth. Um, let's pop it over to the main screen and see who's in the stream. We got Dan's in the house. Rejected a pleasure. So far, it's a decent, fine day in crypto land. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Paul. Welcome, rejected, especially for our beloved Danny Coins. Yeah, they're doing wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, the narrative there is just extraordinary. Uh, it's an enterprise being built. Um, there's a lot of projects. There's a lot of protocols. There's very few that emerge into a full-on enterprise, uh, and that is something that is unique, that's rare. It's a bit of a, a prize when it occurs, uh, and that's uh, what he's building. And he has a heck of a team. And these are old school boys. And their skill set is spectacular. And even more so, maybe even more than their skill set, is the momentum uh, and their networking and their capacity to draw in additional skill set. That's probably the hardest part of starting an enterprise is to be able to attract and capture the skill set needed for the enterprise to solidify, to grow roots, and to continue expansion to fulfill um, uh, its its narrative, and and that's what's occurring. It's it's pretty it's special what he's building. Um, everyone is indeed learning how to spell Dan and Bassard. Pleasure, Paul. Nine waiting for stream at one like we thirty eight people in the stream. Thirty. Teen likes we can do better. <laughs> F the Gillis Andrew. Good morning. Would ask for it be an appropriate channel to ask about setting up an LLC for tax purposes. I can't get into such detail. Ask for it. A lot of people are asking me some very detailed things, and I'm, I'll help the best I can. You're very welcome to ask such a question, but I'm not an expert. And I'm not going to open up an LLC for tax purposes. I'm going to handle everything from the perspective of sole proprietorship. Um, and now I, what I can guarantee is that if a question is asked on AskFit, I will respond in the best detail that I can with information that I think of relative to the question. And all the answers are going to be stuff that I think of relative to how I would, uh, behave or act or think of a particular topic. Um, encoder. Hello. My man, uh, another pump for CRV. CRV, I uh, expect to just keep on going. Uh, Josh, a pleasure. Crypto bets. YouTube let me down and didn't send the notification. I'm sorry. Yeah, centralized social media. Well, we know where all this is heading. Um, no opinion on helium mining, Paul. Alex, where are you currently staking Ample? Uh, well, Ave. Uh, and that, and I'll explain. Let me get into Ample in a second. Just hit some comments. Um, Leon, description in the video. I don't handle social media that well. I really think of the titles about five seconds before the stream. And a lot of the content I don't really write a description for. And a lot of the title I don't overwhelmingly discuss. A lot of my titles are mostly the introduction to the video. And then I try and remain on topic. But I really love the 
the stream for the Q&A component. I like you guys asking questions, and I like having open dialogue about them while trying to remain on topic at least a little bit. <laughs> Quantified. Hey, Noah, what a time to be alive. It's spectacular, isn't it? Crypto bets. Any thoughts on locking CVX as a revenue stream? Sure. Tetranode thinks it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. Whether CVX or CVX CRV is the better bet, we'll only know in hindsight. I know that my narrative is rational. CVX is the asset to accumulate for protocols to control the current monetary policy. CVX CRV is the revenue capturing asset. It captures convex monetary policy, curve monetary policy, and curve protocol transaction fees. So that's obvious and really uh, non-debatable. Uh, whether CVX produces more revenue over time is interesting because of the bribe component, um, it's possible that bribes could outperform even protocol revenue because that, that that's a possibility. Uh, we'll only know in hindsight which generates more revenue, more of a revenue stream. Um, you know, just because I own more vastly more CVX CRV as compared to CVX doesn't necessarily mean it's going to outperform in the long run. Why did I do that? I did that because I'm not in this to make as much money as possible. I do what I do. I make the choices I make because of the stories I tell and my conviction to uh, res respect my conclusions. So my conclusion is that CVX is for protocols and CVX CRV is to capture revenue. It's very possible that CVX generates more revenue in the future. That's not impossible at all. Uh, Ryan, uh, Klima, Dow is another algorithmic stable. Well, it's a fork. It's a fork of, uh, of Wonderland. Um, so this rebase group is quite, quite fascinating. The more I understand uh, the Fed, the commercial banking system, and, and reserves, the way these central banks uh, handle liquidity and, and maintaining uh, the balance sheet of, uh, of commercial banks. Uh, you know, clearly, I'm not a historically trained macroeconomist, um, but I find it fascinating. And the extent of what I understand, there's a lot of overtones that sound similar, that feel similar. And that's one thing uh, that I've done to get me to where I am. Um, I, I see, um, I, I'm able to model things in my mind. I see things that relate to one another that kind of sound like the same story. And I always have a historic story, which I'm not going to tell, but I, re I remember in college that I did a model experiment where it was something and something else. And they were completely unrelated technologically, but I was able to explain something in terms of something else that made sense. And that's kind of what I do in the crypto space especially with regard to macroeconomics. I see a lot of the stuff that's going on. I think, try and think about them in terms of monetary policy, inflation, deflation, and velocity. And now with uh, Olympus Dow and, and Wonderland, uh, I think of them in terms of bank reserves and bonds, which are novel monetary policy components that didn't exist in DeFi summer 2020. And they're brand new in most regards the last couple months, um, but they have the feel of what central banks do with uh, with monetary policy. Now, rebasing is another story. Uh, rebasing is somewhat like reserve, reserve flow, such that banks always have balanced books. Uh, you know, capital is always flowing. And in this instance, reserve capital is to the tune of countless trillions of dollars on a daily basis. 30 40 trillion dollars i wouldn't be surprised if it migrates and moves around the back channels of the banking system to make sure all the books are balanced so when you see these exorbitant numbers 30 40 50 60 thousand percent not a rebase component uh these extreme numbers aren't necessarily entirely outlandish when you're entering the realm of back-channel banking. Not the public-facing banking, but the back-channel banking. Uh, let me do a couple questions. I'll try and get to everyone as best I can. But I have uh, Ampleforth up that's breaching $2 uh, with a rebase occurring in less than 10, around 10 hours. Um, Klaus, Noah, you see 
Ample as similar to Time and Ohm? No, I do not. It shares the rebase component, but as you can see, the price action is quite intriguing. Uh, and they tr they want it to be at a dollar. Um, as you can see here, their price target is a dollar six. So if you literally just look at how the software is going to rebase circulating supply, um, it's an easy 100%, sh you know, 50% short. The, the price is going to get cut in half. So that's why if you go on Ave, it's being borrowed to an extreme. Um, every time there is liquidity, and that that's what's starting to create a bit of conviction that I'm understanding what's playing out. Every time there's a bit of liquidity, it's borrowed. Even though it's 186,000% interest to borrow it. Because in 10 hours, there's a 50% short setup that's going to hit. So 50%. In 10 hours, 186,000% annualized. People that put in work to do that rebase arbitrage have a capacity to capitalize. Um, but obviously, the long-term duration hold is a passive approach. That's sure. You, look, if you put 20 grand in, in 10 hours, the odds are your position is going to get quickly hit by a 50% retrace. But you're also making 80,000% annualized interest. Uh, which is about 50% per week. So over the m weeks and weeks and weeks, your total ownership of the pie is going to increase. And that's the whole point of the rebase. Your ownership of the pie doesn't, in doesn't increase. Just your circulating supply, your ownership as well as circulating supply is always moving in tandem, uh, proportional. Um, when you're lending, you don't take part in that rebase, so you're exchanging the volatility of the rebase and the work required to do the rebase arbitrage in exchange for the exorb exorbitant yield. So this is all brand new for Ampleforth. It, there was no lending market, and this introduces a very different capital flow dynamic to the price action, whereas historically it was just um, rebase arbitrage, uh, and there was no other way to really expose yourself uh, to the capital flow of the asset. So I find them introducing or getting into the Aave money markets very interesting for how it's going to affect the future for the asset. Now, rebasing is a component of Omen time as well. There's a whole different story to tell about Omen time, which I don't necessarily want to get into. Um, I'll, I'll make some broad statements probably in tweets about what I think of them as assets or maybe portfolio components. Um, but for now, um, I wanted to bring up Ampleforth because of the title of the stream. And if you look at the chart, so if you look, we're, we're expecting a 50% drawdown in 10 hours. But we're also expecting the rate of return, the income, the revenue stream to compensate for the 50% drawdown. So this is a great analogy for what should play out with entire portfolios over a bit of a longer time frame, especially if you have a macroeconomic deflationary impulse. You can have a 50% drawdown in your portfolio, but if the portfolio is generating revenue, over time, the portfolio is going to grow. The portfolio principle will reinflate, will reappreciate, and the revenue just keeps on coming in. And that's exactly what we saw historically with Ampleforth, but now even more so with the money market, it changes it to be even more comparable to the way I see a portfolio behaving in the face of a strong macroeconomic deflationary impulses in the future. It's pretty much inevitable, um, just as the inevitability of the rebase to cause the 50% drawdown. Let's keep going on this thought, but let me hit some questions. Um, Wade, thank you, Noah, for doing what you do. You're very welcome. Larry, Noah, thank you for your financial wisdom. I have a strange question. What is your take on adding a lot of new capital to the space? Complicated topic, and I'm biased. I can't give a great answer because I haven't added capital to the space since March of 2020. Um, capital just comes out at this point. These are businesses that generate revenue. They generate income. Um, manage your balance sheet. 
grow your balance sheet. And just like a business, uh, there'll be self-sustaining constructs that that emit revenue streams. Um, and, and that's the goal. And half the goal there is not necessarily how much capital do you need to do that? Because you could do that at any amount of capital. Now, gas costs introduces a complexity, but you could operate on Arbitrum, Avalanche, Phantom, or Polygon to do this business ideology. Um, it, it's not dependent on total amount of capital. It's really dependent on fully um, acclimating to, uh, processing, and digesting a mode of operation with capital and a mode of operation with a business. And, and, and that's the hardest thing to acclimate to. It's not necessarily the amount of capital you have. And clearly, you're talking about moving capital in. Sure, you can move capital in. There's great things to dollar cost average from a savings perspective. There's great places to deploy capital to Curve. I know Curve's through the roof. Um, in five years, do you expect it to be less? So you're going to have, in the face of the meaningful appreciation that has occurred thus far, you might have to have longer time horizons. Um, and then, and that's how you compensate for expected vol, uh, volatility in the short term. Now, if I expect some sort of deflationary impulse, probably sooner than later. If you follow the contrarian macroeconomist like Stephen Van Meter, Jeff Snyder, so on and so forth, um, it's quite possible to have very strong transitory deflationary impulses. Um, and actually, I, I find the way things are playing out uh, quite fascinating with regard to Brent Johnson's ideology and the you know, milkshake type stuff. Dollars going up, bonds are going up, and the markets are going up. Stock market, and clearly the crypto space is basically asymmetrically vertical. Um, quite fascinating. And that, what brings all of that stuff together, and Brent has like the couple of my tweets where I say capital flows from underperforming assets to outperforming. It's a very rational statement, and that's basically based on just human emotion. If something's going up, the majority, the herd, is going to buy it. You all know that from, you know, first time you ever saw a stock. You're like, oh, it's going up. You're going to buy it. So we know the herd buys things that's going up, and that's basically the way the world works. If If a market's getting destroyed and pick a European country, they're not going to necessarily invest in those markets. They're going to invest in a market that's outperforming, and that's the U.S. markets. And that's why, in the face of all this insanity at a macroeconomic level and all this deflationary pressure all over the place that Stephen Mann Meter talks about, you still have capital flowing from all around the world into U.S. equity markets and the dollar as well. Because their fiat is shit, our fiat is less shit. Everyone else's stock market is shit, our stock market is less shit. Still shit, it's all zombie companies. And that's ultimately what I think plays out with the crypto space. It's actually not shit. The crypto space is exciting and novel and new. So it'll take more time for the masses to fully realize that. But the same fundamental principle still applies. Capital flowing from underperforming to outperforming. If the crypto space is outperforming the U.S. equities markets, capital is going to flow into the crypto space. But dare we say once the masses realize that the equities markets are shit and the crypto space is literally not shit, that's more than just capital flowing from underperforming to outperforming. That's actually capital flowing from a broken, deprecated system to a thriving, burgeoning system. So that's when you get that, you know, hyper Bitcoinization type ideology, which I don't entirely agree with. Um, I like the way a lot of Bitcoin maximalists talk. I think uh, it's a, it's short sighted in many regards. Obviously, I like the way Raul talks about tech. He talks about sure, Bitcoin has its narrative, and I agree with that. Bitcoin has its narrative, um, but tech, tech has its narrative. You need financial markets, and no sovereign country is going to give up financial markets. No, uh, you know, no Wall Street is going to give up things to trade and things to speculate on. So th this type of tech that's being built isn't just going to be 
deprecated in favor. Oh, everyone just collects Bitcoin. It's fucking boring. No one's, no world is going to head in that direction. That's not a rational thought. So that's where I think Bitcoin maximalism really falls short. It's not rational to expect stock markets or any markets and no speculation and no you know, gambling, so to speak. It's not going away. That's definitely part of human nature, no matter what anyone says. Um, uh, Larry, you mentioned dry powder. You mentioned too late. So dry powder is a luxury. I know a couple of big names that have a very nice amount of dry powder, and that's good. If you have a capacity to have dry powder on the sidelines, that's the Buffett play. Buffett always keeps a lot of dry powder, expecting the deflationary impulse. He's the uh, you know clean up an aisle five kind of guy. Um, if you got a lot of dry powder and the transitory deflationary impulse comes, uh, you're just mopping up. You're buying all these revenue-generating assets. And that's what he's always done in legacy finance. He buys companies that have been destroyed at a stock valuation level, and he just buys them up. And they get rebuilt. The economy strengthens. The federal agencies intervene in the markets and stabilize things. And the companies he bought generate revenue. So he accumulates revenue-generating assets. What we've done, what I have told stories about for the last two years, is how to do that at the retail level because the crypto space allows us to do that now. It allows us to do exactly what Warren Buffett and hedge funds do, and frankly, Forex markets, which you never could do, but you can do in the crypto space. So dry powder is the Buffett play. I think of it as a luxury. Um, Dry powder, if you have it, great. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but if you want to grow the portfolio, you accumulate dry powder from yield. You have business income, business income, and you're putting stuff on the side. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that, in my opinion. That's not necessarily what I'm doing at the moment. I am very prepared for 50% drawdowns. If I see my portfolio take a 50% hit and I'm generating this similar revenue, Maybe depressed revenue, maybe there's a very bearish sentiment in the market and revenue gets hit by 50%. I'm still generating revenue. And at some point, given an adequate time horizon, it reappreciates. And we've seen that time and time again with obviously the equities markets and even with Bitcoin, which is fascinating uh, because we saw it get hit to 3,000 and now it's at 60 something thousand. So it. It's just volatility. It's very hard to process the degree of volatility that occurs in the space. And it's very hard for people to sit on their hands and buy something at 60000 let it drop to 3000 to watch it go to a half a million in two plus years. But that that's a great play. If you bought at sixty grand and there's some calamity at the macroeconomic level and it goes to $5,000, $10,000 and you're losing all this money, but you know that in a couple of years, the whole system is just going to inflate because that's what it has done many times, and it should rhyme. So what does that mean? It should rhyme. It's going to go up. The rhyme is how far. It's probably going to go more, but it's going to go at least back up to where it was and higher. How much higher? That's the speculative part. Um, but it will reflate. It will reappreciate, given enough of a time horizon. Anyway, I digress. Paul, are you on Instagram? I am not. Joshua Marino, howdy. Joe, what do you think? We'll see perfect publicly traded Dow unknown. I can't stand public markets and all the regulation and the paper. I can't stand licenses and and permits and paperwork. It, it drives me nuts. I got permits going for the house that take six months. It's the most ridiculous system I've ever seen. I'm tired of it, and I just, it's so frustrating. It really is. Uh, Dan, do you just lock CVX and Convex? That's all you need. Convex is everything. It manages CVX as well as CVX CRV. Um, Crip guy, good morning. Uh, uh, Vlaku? Captain, thinking about your statement that you don't have to make as much money as possible. I understand where you come from, but somehow it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right because it's somewhat contrarian. And that's why I like it. I like things that initially make you uncomfortable, but then you realize it makes sense. What's most important is that you respect 
your ideas and you respect your conclusions. And if those ideas and if that respect plays out well in your favor, you can always tell the story that you did what you did because you saw it and you believed in it. And it was your conclusion that it was right. And that's the most important thing to hang your hat on. Not because you speculated, oh, I took a risk. I never thought this was going to play out the way it did. And I made a fortune. That sounds like a shit conclusion to a story. But if you're at a dinner table and say, yeah, I did well. How did you do well? Oh, I had some really rigorous ideology. I stuck to my convictions and it played out. That's a much better story. Even though it won't make as much money as possible necessarily. Um, Nick, I bought Spell Ice Time without much of a plan. Tips for adjusting on the fly. I don't have any tips. I just have the ideology I talk about. Um, time, I expect to at some point hit the risk-free price, which could be you know an 80-90% drawdown. This plays into some of the volatility I expect for Ampleforth, uh, Ohm, and Time. It makes sense for that 90% drawdown, but as per documentation and yield, uh, it will grow over enough of a time horizon. Spell and ice. Ice is still speculative territory. Uh, it's uh, When Popsicle launches, it could go absolutely parabolic. Let's take a look. Oh, $32 with a wick up to 38 Incredible price action. This is all speculative. I don't know if Ice will be, uh, you know, buy the hype, sell the event type stuff. Sell the news. I don't know. Buy the news, sell whatever that phrase is. Uh, we'll see what plays out. We'll only know in hindsight. Uh, but this uh, it's a heck of a revenue generating asset speculatively. And that's all I know. All I know is I want to accumulate more and more revenue generating assets. Assets that pay me to hold them. Don't buy assets if they don't pay you to hold them. Be a Warren Buffett. If you got the dry power, you scoop them up on the cheap when there's a deflationary crash. Otherwise, you're still you're buying assets that are paying you, whether they're at a premium or a discount. Accumulate assets that pay you every second of every day. Sam, thoughts on Luna? I don't have a rigorous narrative around it. I have a high opinion of it because of the way Daniel talks. I like what I understand about UST. I also like what I understand about FRAX. I don't have a rigorous narrative that I could talk about in story form. Uh, isn't Ample $15? I'm obviously lost here. Ample is a buck and change. Two bucks. Ample. Is that about $1.97? With a rebase coming, that's going to push it down to a dollar sixty-one. So I expect, you know, you're going to get a fifty percent cut on your portfolio if you got twenty grand in here. It's going to rip down to ten grand. But accordingly, now uh, you're getting eighty-three thousand percent return, which is about fifty percent a week, give or take. Um, I, if you want to find conviction. Watch this page. This is the Ampleforth page on Ave, and see. Watch this five thousand dollars get scooped up quickly. If it gets scooped up quickly, each and every time liquidity becomes available, it supports the narrative. If the narrative changes and liquidity starts to become available, and folks aren't borrowing, the narrative's changing, which means you have to understand what's going on with the capital flow and the market dynamic, and it may warrant uh, maybe less allocation or maybe some sort of Different um, different way to understand what's going on and how to capitalize on it. Um, Killis, what screen view was you showing AMP? Is there a way to see how much rewards have accumulated since we deposited? Uh, well, you go to your market dashboard, and and it, it this is real time, 80,000% yield. So you're watching it go up meaningful digits every second. I have about 12 chip in here and I have a 10 chip in the geyser. More. It's at about 11 and change. So I have a, I have a fair amount of a position. Uh, bear in mind, uh, you guys always have to understand, for me, this is a tiny, 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 tiny position. Um, so please take that into consideration. And I try and remain humble when I say that. I, I know 
twenty thousand is a massive, massive, massive amount of money. Um, but please respect your portfolio and understand this is not this is not a lot of money for myself. And I know how that may sound, and that brings me great discomfort. I don't want to ever be that guy that trivializes twenty thousand dollars, but I at the same time want everyone here to respect your portfolio and understand if you're going to put 50% of your portfolio into an asset that's going to depreciate 50% in nine hours and 46 minutes, probably not the right or rational course of action, guys. So please respect the portfolio. Um, do you ever see yourself taking capital gains if there's a short-term parabolic rise in one of your core assets? No, I'm done with capital gains. Hello, Buffett. I like what he does. Be like Buffett. Uh, any tip on how paying off an Ave loan? At what point do you take profits versus borrowing more? Uh, uh, I got no tip. Maintain your health factor. Oh, there, I got tips. Maintain your health factor. Uh, always make sure you're able to pay off your debt very quickly. Never jeopardize your principal. Use debt responsibly to leverage to grow your revenue streams. And don't jeopardize your principal. Ever. You need to be able to service your debt. Don't be these companies. Don't need a bailout. You're not going to get one in the crypto space. These companies ran up their debt. They couldn't pay them. They became insolvent, and the government came in and bailed them out, and we got a stock market full of zombie companies. No one's here to bail you out. You're going to get liquidated. You're going to lose your principal. So make sure if you're taking debt, you got a 3.0 health factor on Ave, a 4.0 health factor. Maybe if you go to 2.0, but you're keeping 50% of the capital denominated in stables and you're borrowing stables, so you can easily service the debt or recalibrate uh, the amount of uh, your loan-to-value ratio. Captain Weber's in the house. Always a pleasure. I wish I could do more about that uh, dot complexity. Uh, we'll get to it. Um, for right now, just think of it as secure banking. Uh, but if that, if it's the case that it's the default address. Uh, we'll be able to get it. Um, so don't worry about it too much. Um, Igor, I get service providers like Curve or Ave, but why to emulate value storage money? Once again, ample home if we have BTC for that. Well, it's not. It's emulating existing structures in legacy finance, but in a novel, creative way. Um, and it's not a value storage vehicle. It's more of like, uh, you know, components of legacy finance, bonds and reserve at and you know, bank reserves, because um, they're fascinating and they work and legacy finance understands them. Uh, whereas legacy finance has trouble with BTC. It's a, an alternative narrative with regard to value storage that has overtones more comparable to gold. But we see the way legacy finance looks at gold. So with regard to managing an optimal portfolio, sure, we want to think how the future may play out with regard to BTC. And for instance, BTC maximalism, uh, it, sure, it could get to an extreme like that, uh, but I think more so what Raul talks about, the BTC narrative is undoubtable at this point, but I think because of the way legacy finance, their mindset is and how protective they're going to be over legacy infrastructure, I think tech and emulating and being innovative with legacy financial monetary structures uh, is going to be extremely valuable. So that's very much what Raul sees. So I, I align much so uh, with how Raul talks about what's going to play out. I also align with BTC Maximalist. I just, I think it's a huge amount of opportunity cost. Uh, I think there's a, for instance, I, I'm up like 10x in Bitcoin denomination since March of 2020. Uh, and that means everything. Why, why would I but then again, I always talk about the passive play. Fine, you could do BTC. And for many people, DCA, BTC makes sense. Um, but if you have a capacity to digest these monetary policies, stomach the volatility, um, and understand the capital flow and portfolio management, the nuances, the complexities, and put in the work, you could significantly outperform BTC, which has occurred, and I'm, I'm going to continue doing it. Uh, what the fuck is dry powder? Cash. Dry powder is cash. If you got dry powder sitting on the side, you got 20 grand sitting on the side, and curve drops to back to 50 cents or a dollar in some sort of massive macroeconomic deflationary impulse, use dry powder to snatch it up. 
to buy up the revenue generating assets. That's dry powder. Fubair, legacy financial term. Fubair, DeFi is the fundamental building blocks of technological shift from centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges. Apple being traded not on one server in New Jersey, but 10,000 servers globally. Very true statement. Just as computers replace open outcry pits, uh, DeFi replaces central server farms. Uh, well, m part of that and more much more like Filecoin decentralizes uh, uh, Amazon Cloud. So amongst other things, there's a lot of components to what you're thinking, uh, which I agree with. Sam, if you are making money by yield or by principal rising, that's just a mental distinction, is it not? It is not. Uh, because if you're making money by appreciation of an asset, and the only function of the asset is to be sold, you got to understand the market participants. Everyone else also knows the only fucking use case of the asset is to sell it. So that's what everyone's going to do. They're going to dump it. They're going to sell it the second they have a drop of fear. So it's different with an asset that pays you because the market participants are different. They're going to behave differently under certain circumstances. Um, I don't know how it plays out with uh, fourth, Matthew. Uh, I don't have that part of my narrative currently. Daniel, why does it feel weird to spend the interest when my interest is greater than my principal in yield farms? Well, you want to spend your interest. Your interest is your revenue stream. So maybe you have some bills. You got a mortgage payment. Maybe you have some car insurance to pay. Maybe you have some credit card bills. That Your revenue stream. If you want to have more of your revenue stream for reinvestment, spend less money. And I go through this all the time. Uh, you know, One week, I have to take a certain amount out of crypto to pay some bills. And the next week, I'm like, honey, let's chill out a little bit because I want to save up some cash. I want to put a couple bucks into uh I want to DCA into time or I want to DCA into Ohm or, or Ample or just maybe even DCA into Bitcoin for that matter. But in order to do that, I need to spend less. So you got to fold what you're doing into the crypt, in the crypto space into how a business owner thinks. Operate like a business. This is a source of your income. Food for thought. Do you need to be in the geyser to reap the rewards? Yeah. Not necessarily. You're getting more. So you're getting 70%. So I'm getting 70% on 12 grand which is cool. Um, and here I'm not. Here I'm just getting this. But this yield is, hey, look, check it out. Uh, how's that for a narrative? All that available liquidity was taken. Someone borrowed every last drop of it. Every last drop. Because they're going to short the crap out of this. It's two bucks. They're going to short the crap out of it. In nine hours and 39 minutes, when the amount of ample they have basically doubles, so they're going to be able to sell and get pretty much 100% of their money, a 50% short, uh, in a blink of an eye when the rebase occurs. Um, but now it's cheaper. So people will be able to buy ample cheaper and get yield because some then the whole cycle repeats again. It's not going to be 87,000%, in my opinion, in nine hours when the rebase occurs it's likely this will crash so you know probably a couple hundred percent but then it 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 starts all over again the whole cycle starts all over again it's a very interesting capital flow and we'll see how it plays out but that's kind of the sense where i think it's heading um jerry why are you suggesting that paying income tax is better than capital gains uh yeah i pay income tax because one, one i live in a tax favorable state i have no way state income tax uh, short-term capital gains is the same as in federal income tax. So I technically pay the same uh, as uh, federal income tax in most regards, depending on my tax bracket. So I'm probably going to pay more than capital gains. But I predominantly don't want to pay capital gains because it annoys the crap out of me. And in any case, when you press the claim button on income, that's income. It's not capital gains. So technically, it is income. It's not that I want to pay income. It technically is income. Um uh, but the capital gains and the reporting requirement is just atrocious. So I want to avoid capital gains at all costs and just focus on income. Income is just top line. You know, 1099, you put on your extra source of income. I made X amount of dollars and zero cost basis. It's income. It's trivial with regard to 
tax reporting obligations income, whereas capital gains, they want every single transaction and cost basis. It's an absolute shit show. Larry, okay, got it, thanks. Are you then redistributing capital earned from the day job into the crypto space? No, I don't need to. Uh, cap Right now, the crypto space is a job. I, I don't need to put more capital into the business. Uh, what do you do with the capital? That's what I'm trying to figure out how to play the day job. Day job pays my bills. I live off it. It's my salary. Wave mappers, you should not feel bad talking about money amounts. I believe retail is in the position that they are because majority find the taboo to talk about money. Uh, the only way anyone will ever learn about this is to, to hear someone talk about it. So I, I agree with you and I, and I thank you. I, I, I try my best to remain grounded and, and rational and you know, I'm a bit of an open book, which my wife yells at me about, but I, I think it's important and I think you know, as we've seen over the last two years, I've had an opportunity to help folks, and it's kind of why I, I do what I do. You guys know that by now. We've talked about this before. Kill us by the blood. Oh, that's that's Buffett right there. You Buffett? You Buffett, aren't you? <laughs> uh, hey, Noah, hyped about Bancor V3. I got my Bancor position. It's small, relatively speaking, but it's there. Still there. Um uh, I free spell at 2.5 cents. Woo! We'll check back at 25 cents. Lewis, I've never seen 85 on the stream before. It's a big number. That's a pleasure. 85 people in the stream, 44 likes. We can do better. <laughs> Matthew, this will be testing ground. Hopefully, the holders will spread the love to the Gov token. We'll see. We'll see. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 12, 24 p.m. on a Monday, October 25th. As always, tell everyone to subscribe. Little, little, little. Tell everyone to subscribe. It's a pleasure. After party on Discord, I'm going to get to the Ask Viz and help you guys out as much as possible. It's only Monday. I'm going to see you again tomorrow. Wish you all a wonderful day now.